purple was the most expensive dye in the ancient world. He didn't have it for the dress up days. He dressed this way every single day, morning, noon and night, fine linen. And he lived in luxury every day. He ate whatever he wanted, whatever he wanted to do. He was able to do it. It's not just rich. It's not. This is obscene wealth, wealth so much so that you have begun to think you are self-sufficient. You don't need anyone else. You have everything that you need. But it's also the story of obscene poverty. I'm not talking about you, your own hard times, but obscene poverty. Look at what it says in verse 20. At the rich man's gate laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores. And all he wanted to do was to eat the food that fell from the wealthy man's table. Two people, one in obscene wealth, the other in obscene poverty. No one should be so poor that they have nothing to eat, that, 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 that they have nothing to eat, that the dogs are eating better than they are because the scraps and the crumbs belong to the dogs and the dogs are doing better than the person who's created in the image of God. And when we still live in a world where that is all too often true, those of us who have been blessed by God have to ask ourselves, how do we live with ourselves when we know that God has blessed us beyond what we need? Ain't nobody saying amen with me now. But here's a story. Here's a story of obscene wealth, of obscene poverty. And most importantly, it's a story of obscene indifference. That this wealthy man is indifferent to the situation of the poor man. So poor that he has nothing. And the only compassion, y'all listen to me now, the only compassion that the beggar finds, he finds from the dogs. That this man who has everything doesn't have as much compassion as dogs that run around on the street. At least they came over to offer some solace, to offer some comfort, to, to let him know that I know you're still alive. They, they were there. Sometimes saints, we don't care about people unless they're in our tribe, unless they're going through what we are going through. Here's a man laying at his gate. <laughs> Here's a man that's laying in the in and out, the going in and out of his life. Who has God put in your gate? Who has God put in your way? You see him every single day, and God is calling us not to walk by. There's a great divide between these two people. Even though they're living in the same world, in the same community, in the same neighborhood, they could not have been more different. They could not have been more different. The wealthy man has come to a place where he doesn't even see Lazarus as really human. Just something to walk by each and every day. But let me share you, with you something in the text. You'll find it in verse 20. At the gate laid a beggar and he had a name. His name was Lazarus. He had a name. Everybody that you're walking by, I don't know their situation. I don't know their circumstance, but they have a name. They, they are somebody. God knows their name, and because they are named by God and they are important to God, their names matter. That's why we say black lives matter. That's why we say say their names. That's why we say Brianna. That's why we say their names over and over again. And God puts in this parable a name name called Lazarus. That boy, that name Lazarus comes from this. Listen to what it means. It means God help. It means God's helping me. God is taking care of me. When it doesn't look like that, the man has nothing. He's so sick, so weak that somebody has to bring him every day and lay him down on the ground. Someone has to bring him every single day. Put him in that place. And the rich man has made a decision not to see him. A rich man has made a decision not to be with him. It's important for us, my sisters and brothers, to know that God is asking us, do you see the Lazarus is around you? Do you see the lives that are around you that you think mean nothing, what they truly mean to God? God has helped us. God has helped us. I'm broke. I'm begging. I'm at the gate. But God is still my God. 
God is still my God when I have nothing the same way he is when I have everything. Listen, things don't have to be that way. Life doesn't have to be binary. Life doesn't have to be some have and some don't. Saints, we have agency. We have the ability to make a decision about how we will use what God has given us. If you took the time to look back in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 18 and 19, it's another story about a rich man. It says that this rich man's produce had multiplied so much that when he looked at all of his stuff, he says, look at all of my stuff. I don't have any room for my stuff. I, I tell you what I'll do. I'll tear down the bonds I have and build myself some bigger bonds and put all of my stuff in it. And then I'll sit back and have a good life and rest. But the Bible says, thou fool. Today, your life will be required of you. And then whose will all of that stuff, whose will it be? Will it belong to someone else? You can't take it with you. God is asking you, asking me, what are you doing with the things I put in your hands? We have agency, saints. We can make decisions. That man who had an abundance of produce could have said, you know, I'm going to sell enough of that to take care of myself. I'll sell enough of that to put to the side in case there's some difficult days. I'll, I'll, I'll sell enough to make sure that my children have a good start uh, in life, that they have a good education. But the rest of it, <laughs> the, the rest of it I choose to use to bless somebody else, to feed someone else, to care for somebody else. He could have made that choice, but because he chose to focus only on himself, his value was himself and himself alone. Saints, we have agency. Things don't have to be the way they are. Things don't have to be the way they are in our society. Our economy doesn't have to be the way it is. Our politics don't have to be the way they are. The way we police, we don't have to police that way. The way we provide health care to our communities, we don't have to do it that way. The way we teach our children, the way we care for one another, the way we value one another, it doesn't have to be the way it is. We don't have to live racist lives. We don't have to live misogynistic lives. We don't have to live lives that exploit other people. We have agency we can make a choice and choose to live in a different way we can choose to share we can choose to love we can choose to know that when God blesses us abundantly if we give it away he'll give us some more of that not so we can become richer but because we so that we can become better stewards of what God has given us we could choose to have mercy somebody every day they're not named in the story, but they helped him get in the gate. Look at what it says. He was laid in the gate. Couldn't crawl there. Sometimes just the little things you do can make such a difference in somebody's life. And, and, and in my mind, I, I see this lavish house with a wrought iron gate, and, and there he is laying before it. And he's long since given up that the owner of the house is going to do anything about his situation. But maybe he thinks if I position myself at the gate where the other folk come in to see him, the other people in the neighborhood, the people at the synagogue, the people at the temple, the people at the Methodist church, the people at the Baptist, Pentecostal, saved, Holy Ghost, Spirit. some of those folks, surely they've been to church sometime this week. Surely they've been in the presence of God. And when they see my situation, when they see my condition, God's going to touch their heart and somebody will have mercy on me today. Somebody will give me my daily bread. Someone will help me because I can't help myself. Saints, we have agency. We have an opportunity to make a difference. But like Acts chapter 3, the man who's laying at the gate called beautiful, most church folk, we just walk on by. We just go about our business, saints. God is giving you an opportunity. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it looks like. But that great divide between those who have and those who have not. And if you have something, it's not simply for you. Let me tell you something. Here's what the story tells us. Rich or poor, we all going to die. Rich or poor, you can't buy another day. You can't rent another day. You can't put a down payment on another day. Every day is unto itself. And the scripture says that both of them died. Verse 22, the time came when the beggar died 
and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this life. Everybody has to die. Listen with me now. You're saved by grace, but how you live here matters. You're not saved by what you do here, but if you're saved, it'll change what you do here. You're not saved by what you do. You can't work your way to heaven. You, you can't give away everything you have and get a ticket to heaven. But if you've been saved by the grace of God, it changes how you use what you have. Because now you know that everything belongs to God, that you yourself belong to God. And now what you're used to value, you don't value it that way anymore. You value your relationship with God more than any anything else in this world. You want to be right with God. You want this thing to be right with God. That's your most important desire in life. I wish I had three folks saying amen with me. I, I, I want to be right with God. If I'm wrong with my neighbor, if I'm wrong with somebody else, I want to be right with God because if I'm right with God, sooner or later, I'll get right with my neighbor. I'll be in the right position with my neighbor, but I need to put God first. We're saved by grace, but how we live matters. Giving a cup of water to the thirsty matters. Jesus says, what you've done to the least of these, you've done it all so for me. And so if I'm saved by God, saved for God and to God, then I got to live in this world as if God has made a difference in my life. I got some bad news for three or four of you today. Your status here will not transfer to heaven. You, you can't take your bonus points with you. You can't do none of that in heaven. When, when you stand in heaven, all of us, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, when we stand in heaven, all of us have to give an account of what's done in our bodies. You can't take it with you. The writer of Revelations, chapter 3, verse 17 says, You say, I am rich, I've acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and exposed. Some folk think that the more zeros you have, the happier you'll be. Oh, you can buy more stuff. You can drink more things. You can go more places. But it will not fill that space in your soul that's shaped for God. That space that only God can fill in your life and my life. And when God fills that heart-shaped place in your life, you have a heart and compassion for other people. Let me tell you, it matters how you treat folk. It matters how you treat people. And it's not just that common old saying, what you do comes back around. Some folk get away with it. Nobody ever knows what you're doing. But sooner or later, we have to give an account to the one who made us. We have to give an account to that God. How you treat the least matters. When I look at the story of that rich man and that other Lazarus, Lazarus was treated in such a shameful, obscene way. Saints, we live in a world where people are treated like that every single day. We are in a struggle, not for the soul of America. We're in a struggle for the soul of God's people. God's people who say they love Jesus who knew poverty. They love Jesus who gave up everything, and yet they still put that knee on the neck of the poor. They still put their hands on the throat of those who can barely breathe. God, the systems don't have to be that way. It matters how you treat the least of these. When I was hungry, when I was sick, when I was in prison, when I couldn't find my way, when I was wrong, you came to me and you told me about Jesus. You ministered to me and you did what you could on my behalf. And because of that, you changed my life. Jesus says that's what's important, not the other things that we collect along the way. And look at how pitiful this story really is. Even in hell, the rich man don't change. Some folk just never going to get it. Yeah, that's what I, even in hell, the rich man doesn't change. Look with me at verse 24. So he called Father Abraham, 
have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. Now, I need you to follow me. This brother has the hellacious audacity to be in hell ordering Lazarus around. Even in hell, he say, tell him to go get me something. You see, when you see people as less than you, you can never see them as equal to you until you see them the way God sees them. Here he is, Father Abraham. Yeah, I'm your child, a child of Abraham. But you no longer see, and by the way, even though he acted as if he didn't know him in the world, he really knew who he was. You and I, if we are believers, the Holy Spirit lives in us, and the Holy Spirit can't lie with us, will not lie on our behalf. We know what's right if the Spirit is on the inside of us. We know that we have to live for what's right. This rich man, even in hell, says I'm better than him. Send him on a chore. And you never hear Lazarus say a mumbling word. Because things have transformed for Lazarus. Things have changed for Lazarus. He had it tough on this side, but now he's in the bosom of Abraham. Now he's on the side of Abraham, and all that used to be is no more. Saints, we need to tell people that what used to be can change today because we have something better than Abraham. We have Jesus the Christ. We have the one who took on our flesh and lives among us, and we are his. Matters how you treat folk. Money in and of itself is an evil. It's the lust of money that reveals who we really are. It, it, it's that, that burning desire. And come on now, come on. We, let, you know, we all like money. We, we, we all like it. We, we try to accumulate it. But saints, when you come to a place where you understand this comes from God and God will hold me accountable for it. And I want to use it in a way that God would be pleased with it. If I'm willing to do that, God will always provide my needs. Not your wants, but God will always provide your needs. Rich man looks across, says to Abraham, send him back. He says, can't go. <laughs> he can't go back. There's a great divide. There's a chasm between where you are and where he is. Well, somebody else say, preach, Pastor Ray. Let me teach you something. That chasm on the other side, that divide between hell and heaven, was the same divide that they had on earth. He ate every day in purple at the best of everything, and Lazarus didn't even have crumbs. That great divide is there because we choose to keep it there. Saints, on this side, we can close the gap. On this side, we can practice kindness and mercy. We can implement legislation and laws to make the ground level and to lift up those who are at the bottom. We can do that if we choose to do it. This story about that other Lazarus is really about our values, what it means to us, what we value people over property, what we value human life over anything else because Christ laid his life down for us, rich man never changes. You can have a good life, but unless you have genuine compassion for your sisters and brothers, you will have to stand before the Lord and give an account. Now, let me end this sermon by reminding you. After Abraham, tell, Abraham tells him he can't do that, he says, I got five or six brothers down there. Send Lazarus back and let Lazarus at least testify to them. Maybe they won't end up where I am. Saints, for those of us who are still left on this side, there's still time. There's still hope for you. You don't have to be anything but a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, what's changed in your life? What's different in your life? What are you doing now that you didn't do before? How do you see the people who are on the side of the road? How do you see the people that we need to pray for each and every day? No longer judging them. No longer seeing them as beneath us. Something to be sneered at. Let me tell you, Jesus is talking about how we deal with what we value. Look back with me in chapter 16 of Luke's gospel. I want to take you to verse 13. Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, uh, I'm going to end before noon. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, 
or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. (laughs) But I, I was watching TV and they told me the more money I got, the more God loves me. But the book says you can only have one master. And money always wants to master you. Money always wants you to bow down to it. But you've got to make a decision that no matter how rough life gets, no matter how high I get, no matter what's going on in my life, I put God first in my life. And God is the master of my life. You can't serve God and money because what will happen is you'll start sneaking around on God. You'll tell God you love him, but you'll sneak around, go in the back door. Come on here, somebody. You'll creep out on God and do your own own thing but if you love God with all of your heart with all of your mind with all of your soul with all of your strength you're going to always put God first now listen when Jesus tells us that we don't really like it verse 14 of chapter 16 says the Pharisees who love money They were in the synagogue. They were in the church. They were baptized, double dipped in the Holy Ghost. They were on the deacon board, the women's auxiliary guard. They were the mothers of the church. They were the youth marching, double drill team group. And yet, when they heard Jesus talk about money, you know I'm right. Folk can do a whole lot of things to you, but don't mess with your money. Don't let your check be short. Don't mess with your money because you'll fight somebody about your money. You'll, You'll struggle about it. The Bible says They love money, and they begin to sneer at Jesus. Sneering ain't nice. (laughs) They begin to deride Jesus, run him down, and, and and he said to them, listen to what Jesus says, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your heart. Saints, we can go around acting like we're Christians, trying to make folk think we're holier than, than we are. The Bible says God knows, right? Listen, it is what it is. God knows your heart. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. Uh-oh, what's highly valued in the eyes of humankind is detestable to God. Not because money is evil. It's because we make the money and the stuff our God. Oh, we won't say it, but the way we act and the way we behave, we make it our God. Still time to change. Uh, America might run out of time, but God's people won't run out of time. There's still time to change. And I know it's sad that some people are going to be like the rich man and never change, no matter what happens. But saints, we've got to continue to preach. We have to continue to live. We have to continue to exhort and encourage people to put down anything but Jesus and to lift him up in every situation and everything. Lazarus finally got his change. Sooner or later, God's going to change your life. God's going to change your situation. I don't know when. Not everybody's going to leave this world with all of the stuff in this world. But if you leave with Jesus, that's enough. If you leave this world and you have been faithful in whatever place God has placed you, doing your best to lift him up, God will bless you. And I want to ask you today, what will it take for you to make your change? Oh, rich man, obscenely rich. Is that who you want to be in this world? They have more than you could ever count, more than you could. No, no, Pastor, I don't want that much. I just don't want to struggle. Saints, if I struggle with Jesus, I'd rather struggle with him than have everything in this world. Maybe today there's someone. And the church has confused you over time because the church has been teaching you that the only way to be blessed is to have the purple clothing, to have the fine linen, to eat what you want, go, and that that means that you're blessed. Saints, if you bought into that lie, renounce it today. God takes you where you are right now, and God will lead you to where God wants you to be. I can't guarantee what that will be. If If God God keeps keeps you in poverty, poverty, be the best best witness you can. But I don't believe that God wants you to suffer. God wants you to grow so that you can be more like him. So today, saints, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to give your life to Jesus. To give your life to Jesus for the first time. You don't need an intermediary. You don't need a priest. You don't need a prophet. You don't need a priest. You don't need a shift in the atmosphere. You don't need this, that. All you need is a heart that's broken. 
a heart that says, God, here I am. I trust you. I believe in you. I believe you are the Messiah. I believe you came down. You love me so much that you died. And I believe you got up on the third day. And because you live, I can live different. It's saints, if you believe that, the Bible says in Romans 10, you shall be saved. If you don't know him today, give your life to him. If you're looking for a church home, a place, a place to live out your faith. faith. Clearly, Clearly, we'd like you to be a part, part of our church, church but that's, that's not, <laughs> that's not, not the most important thing. thing. Saints of God, send us an email. Go to our website. Let us know that you're looking for a place to live out your faith. And we'd be happy to walk with you and grow and help you become a better disciple as you help us become better disciple makers. God, we give your name the praise, honor, and glory. In just a moment, we're going to share an announcement with you, so please stay with us. And then just in about three minutes, we're going to have q and I'll be there for q and I want to talk to you about COVID, church reopening. I want to talk with you a little bit about the church's anniversary, all the things that are ha having to do with that, and also pray for our members who've lost loved ones since last we met. Let us pray together. Lord God, we give your name praise, honor, and glory. If, if I preached preach anything but Jesus, Jesus God, God I, I ask you to forgive me, Lord. If I've lifted myself in any way, God, please diminish me and correct me, God. Chastise me, God, so that when I stand again, if you are gracious enough to give me an opportunity to stand, you will be for any and everything. You'll be forefront. You'll be out there above everything, God. Maybe today, God, maybe today those who are part of this church might ask ourselves, What's most important? What do we really value? What do we value more than Jesus? Let us now, God, be in your presence forever until we see your face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, we are Sydney and Imani, and we're here to share the announcements on the Higher Way Church Jones Memorial United Methodist upcoming 60th anniversary celebration. This is going to be a drive through parade, virtual broadcast of the family video tributes, the Marcus D. Wiley Virtual Comedy Show, and our Sunday morning worship. Join us on Saturday, September 19th for our drive through parade with Ms. Maddie Morris and Ms. Margaret Hall, our two remaining charter members. The lineup is 12.30 p.m. Parade starts at 1 p.m. at Living Faith Church, formerly known as Jones Memorial, located at 4310 Holloway Drive, Houston, Texas, 77047. Although not required, everyone is encouraged to decorate their cars. The family video tribute submission deadline is August 31st. Go to www.tribute.com backslash 60 and upload your video to be broadcasted on Saturday, September 19th at 5 p.m. That's not all, church. The Marcus D. Wiley's virtual comedy show is Saturday, September 19th at 6.30 p.m. on YouTube at The Higher Way. Join us on Sunday, September 20th for our 60th church anniversary's virtual worship service at 11 a.m. We are Sydney and Imani and we approve this message. So uh, still good morning to you for another three or four minutes. Uh, so this is our uh, Q&A with the pastor. We try to do this on every uh, second Sunday. I hope some of you stayed around. If you have a question for me or a comment for me, something you'd like for me to respond to, uh, please put it in the chat uh, room and uh, they'll uh, uh, repeat your question to me and I'll try to respond to that. So I want to give you a couple of minutes to, to begin typing in that. So let me just say a few things. One, just a deep, deep appreciation uh, for those who do ministry in the life of our church. And there's all kind of ministry that goes on in the life of the church. What we tend to see each week has to do with our worship ministry, right? The audio visual, the technology, the preaching, the music. And I am deeply, deeply grateful uh, to those persons who do that and, and, and give their hearts and minds and time and skill set to that. But I also want to thank those in ministry who are taking care of our sick and shut-in. 
all of those persons, almost 40 that are either at home, unable to come out in nursing homes. I want to thank Sister Joyce Moore and her ministry and her team for doing that kind of ministry. I want to thank those who are, who are helping us do ministry uh, with our city, particularly with HISD, uh, for the pastors, Pastor Enid, for others in the life of the church who lead that kind of ministry. Saints, I always, I always tell you, and I want you to know, we are not responsible for the number of people. We're not responsible for the results of our efforts. We're responsible up for showing up and engaging in ministry that has the potential of blessing someone else's life. Too often in the life of the church, we think things aren't successful unless a lot of people participate in it. I don't know who Jesus is going to bring. If we touch the life of one child, and there are multiple kids there, that's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying, let's make sure we're focusing on the right thing. Jesus first, what has he called us to do? What, what has he given us the ability to do, the resources to do, and are we being good stewards of those resources? And so we're grateful for those of you who are doing that. Let me say a word for those of you who have said, Pastor, I tutor, we do these things. We're waiting for HSD to get into the school year so that they can discern what needs those young people have. So we haven't forgotten about you. We're going to need some tutoring. We're going to need some other resources. Uh, and we want to provide multiple opportunities. There are, are groups that are together that can help parents over time. We have individuals in our church, and we're going to try to tap into all those resources. Thank you to those of you who gave us old laptops and iPads so that we could have them refurbished and give the kids in our community so that they would be ready on day one. Saints, I'm already thinking. <laughs> I know, by the way, I am really thinking. I haven't talked to Enid about this or anybody. I'm already thinking. Enid's probably looking like, oh, no, he's not. <laughs> so I am thinking to reach out to the Texas Annual Conference and say, okay, is there a way we can help HSD contact these kids? Can we call homes? Can we find a way these kids who are not connected, these kids who have been lost, these are our kids. We've got to think about how can we help. We can't just sit on channel. I ain't going to name the channel. <laughs> I get a little perturbed because it seems like only – only HISD isn't doing a good job. Saints, you can check any school district in this whole region. All of them have had the same problems, crashing, kids not there. So we have a, a divine opportunity to say, how can we come alongside and help these kids, right? So we'll be looking into ways in which maybe we can help HISD. Man, we could create a phone bank. <laughs> <laughs> out of the out of this world, right? To reach out and just do our very best, and if we if it's successful, great. If not, also I want to remind you: uh, it's time to think about voting, right? <laughs> Absentee voting uh, during the time in which we are, are able to go. Please do that. Please take advantage of this. This is not one to sit out. This is not one. Young people, young people, put this in your phone. I, I think we should text all of our young people election day on their phone so that they have a reminder of that, right? The last day for early voting. We need to send reminders, and you can do that. Send reminders. Put it on your calendar because I know you get busy. I know there's, there's a world of things for you to do. So I wanted to share those things with you. And finally, those of you who came last Sunday uh, to worship on the parking lot, you have helped us in, in such a wonderful way. One, I want to remind you and say today that the radio station is FM 87.9. Didn't do a good job of letting you know that when you came on the parking lot last week. We'll do a better job this week. FM 87.9. We're going to celebrate our church's 60th anniversary. You've heard about that. You've heard about the parade on that Saturday beginning at 1230 at Living Faith Baptist Church, 4310 Holloway. We want you to be there. Uh, we are grateful to that church for allowing us to come. They have a funeral on that day, but they say they'll be ready and gone by 1230. They're so gracious to us. For that, we're grateful. We're going to go to our charter members and just wave our hands like we just don't care in front of them to say thank you to them. So please put that on your calendar. Now, let me say this to you about worship on the parking lot. We're trying to accomplish two things at once. It's important for us to be together. By the way, United Methodist people, if you go to that book of discipline that some of us love so very much, you will find that beginning in the paragraphs of 240, it says that the church exists for the maintenance of worship. That's the first thing it says about the church, that the church exists for the maintenance of worship. It's the place where people gather. 
And saints, I know we're not gathering the way we would want to gather, but they can put 25% in a stadium and have them. Well, we're asking you to come and sit in your car in the air condition with the FM radio. All of you can't do that. That's okay. You are welcome to stay home. It's great. You can still worship that way. But for those of you who choose to come, let's come out next week. We're not going to do this every Sunday, probably once a month, starting in October. On the first Sundays, we'll do it so we can all share communion together. But let me share this with you so your experience will be the best that it can be. So you don't have to get out of your cars. The station is FM 87.9. You can have your AC on. But there's some things that we have to pre-record that we can't do live. And the only way for you to see those is through the live stream and on your devices, a laptop or on your phone. So if you want the full experience when you come uh, to be in worship on the parking lot, bring that device with you and you'll be able to see those things. We have a wonderful, wonderful uh, word from the mayor of our city. If you want to see that, you'll need that extra device on next Sunday. Amen. Finally, you can help us in this way. If you drive one of those high-rise vehicles, right, you could really climb over a mountain in it. If you park toward the, the back so that the, the cars that are uh, passenger cars can be in front, closer to the stage, it'll help everyone see. Do your best to do that. Think about the person in front of you. So wanted to share those things with you. Now check and see if there are any questions from you that I can respond to. Thank you, Pastor. We got a uh, question that's asking, Pastor, how is Jones providing assistance for the storm victims in Lake Charles? So we are not directly uh, uh, providing assistance to the storm victims in, in Lake Charles in terms of us raising and doing things like that. One, I felt our plate was really, really full with all of the things we were trying to do with the University of Houston, with HISD, with our community along the way. But what we are doing with the Methodist Church is responding uh, to those needs through the, through the Texas Annual Conference. So that's how we're responding to those particular tragedies and uh, natural uh, events. And by the way, if you decide that you want to give directly to that, if you send your money in and say you want it to go to hurricane victims, we'll send it because the Methodist Church does have a fund that we can direct money to that goes 100% to victims of that storm. Those are our questions. Well, thank you for asking me that. So let me invite you to a couple of things. I believe this is on our website. I updated our kind of COVID-19 update, what's going on. I shared with you that churches are kind of all over the place about when to start and when to begin. If you haven't read that, I invite you to go and, and do that. Uh, there are some United Methodist churches that never closed. They never closed, not from March 15th until this day. Most of those are very small churches in rural areas, uh, in churches that would seat 200 people and they were worshiping 9, 10, 12 people. But some of our larger churches have opened uh, Sugar Land First United Methodist Church. I understand that some of our other larger churches are opening uh, beginning in October along the way. Some of our churches have already voted uh, to not open until, uh, until next year. So our churches are all over the place. So here's what I think. I am a trained preacher. Uh, Got a Midland education from Perkins School of Theology and took some classes and preached for 35 years. And if I have any expertise, it's in pastoring and preaching. I do not have expertise in epidemiology. I do not have expertise in infectious diseases. And so as my letter states to you, I am looking to those persons to give us an indication of when it is the right time. We'll have to discern that. But I want to err on the side of listening to those who that is what they do. And in the meantime, we'll begin to look at opportunities like the parking lot. That's an opportunity, saints, for us to at least be in the same space and the same uh, place at the same time. So we're working on that. I don't think anybody wants to be uh, in church as, as, as much as I do. This morning I got here, I think probably about 8.15, and CJ was at the gate. It's hard to beat me at church on Sunday morning. Sometimes I'm here. I love the church. I want to be where I can preach and see your faces and hear you talk back to me and see lives changed and people turn to God. But I also have a responsibility to be your pastor 
to try to make the best decision I can for the well-being, not just of a few, but of the many. And so we're going to look for the best ways and the best time. So you keep praying for us. You keep praying that all of the scientists will do their work. And when the time is right, God will speak to us. And we'll know it's the right time for us. So I wanted to share that with you. Don't worry. Don't worry. We're doing well. We're doing well. God is blessing us. Our income is a little down from March to uh, August from what it was last year. But who wouldn't expect that? right? Who wouldn't expect that? But I've always told you that if we give from our hearts, if we give from our hearts, God will take what we give and God will bless it and multiply it. Hence, even though I know we're down on income, I've not asked you for a special offering for the church's anniversary. Well, I could have worked that like the preachers I grew up in church. Well, you know, we're a little down for the year. You got an opportunity to help us catch up on the church's anniversary. I need all of y'all to give $60 in the name of Jesus. If you can't give 60, give 50. If you can't give 50, give 40. But everybody, saints, you know what you have to give. You know what God has blessed you. You know that the church needs resources to do the things that we do. I trust that God's going to touch your heart and you're going to do what you've been doing. You're going to give to the best of your ability. Amen? I have yes. a question. Um, someone wanted to know, is Ricky Smiley still performing? That they, <laughs> they heard it was canceled. Uh, so we don't have Ricky Smiley. <laughs> That's Magic 102. <laughs> we have Marcus Wiley, <laughs> not Ricky Smiley, <laughs> but Marcus Wiley, <laughs> Marcus D. Wiley. And to answer your question, that happens on the 19th, the Saturday before. That will be by Zoom, right? So go to our website. You'll be getting emails, and you'll be able to, from your home, participate in that comedy show. So that will happen on Saturday the 19th. Uh, I can't remember. What, what time was someone telling me the time? And so it, it's in the evening. I'll give you that time in, in just a moment. So please do that. I know it's hard to watch comedy shows at home, but people do it every night. They're watching Jimmy Fallon and all the other people and all the other comedians. This is a different time. No one's ever done this before. Some things won't feel quite as funny or quite as natural, but God has blessed us. And so to answer your question, absolutely. Marcus D. Wiley on the 19th of this month. And that time is? I think it's 7 p. Say again, 6.30 p.m. I'm corrected, not 7 p.m., but 6.30 p.m. on the 19th. All right, another question. Are we doing a school supply drive for families to pick up supplies? We are not doing a school supply drive for families to come by given COVID. We, we don't want that to happen. You'll remember we had an extensive month-long uh, uh, school supply drive we will have those supplies taken to Frost Elementary uh, on uh, once school starts in person. Actually, we'll take it before school starts in person. And so if, you're, if you still want to give toward that drive, you can clearly do that. Now, I hope you know this by the, by the way our church is, and I think this is a part of our heart. If you know of a child who needs school supplies, just call the church and say, we have a child, and, uh, and help us out by telling us what their need, what their grade level is, that kind of thing. We're always going to do what we can uh, to help a child if you have someone, but we're not going to do the drive where persons come here. We will take those uh, to the school. Okay. Announcements Amen. will... I'll I want to give you about another hot 30 seconds to think of a good question, and then I want to say this final thing to you. Pastor, are there any more Bible studies or what's happening in October that we should be aware of? Absolutely. Thank you. The question is, are there any Bible studies? Uh, we're going to remember in, in our regular kind of calendar year uh, that October was our time for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Well, it's still going to be that. Breast Cancer Awareness still is a need, right? We're going to do ministry, saints. We're going to do ministry the way the Church of Jesus Christ has always done it. But also, we're going to do ministry that meets people's needs along the way. So beginning in October, we're going to have an all-church Bible study beginning October the 11th through the 31st, 21 days of prayer. It's going to be a great uh, uh, time for us together, saints. Not only reading about prayer, learning together, reading scripture, but every day you'll have an opportunity to go online 
to a website and, and join in prayer, join in encouragement there. And so I'm encouraging you to do that as well. I also want to thank those of you, uh, particularly couples, married couples, others who are engaged, who are now engaged in our marriage ministry on Thursday evenings. If you're a couple, you haven't done that, go to the website. There are a couple more Thursdays left. And this is just the beginning of that kind of ministry. We have to do ministry in the life of the church so that people can grow in their faith. So uh, new ministries in all church studies, new ministries for our men will be coming. Ministries for singles will be coming. We can't stop doing ministry. Ministry for our children and our teens, that's never stop. We're going to continue to look for ways in which we can do that. And so October is also for us prayer month. Uh, you will have an opportunity. You'll receive a book. We'll give you more information about how to acquire that book that will guide us through that time in October. So lots going on in the life of the church. But I want to remind you that in the midst of that, life goes on. We have so many of our members who are losing their loved ones, not only to this dreaded disease. Last evening, a very good friend of mine married him and his wife probably 20 years ago, uh, passed this morning from COVID, the complications of COVID-19. Uh, uh, this week on Thursday and Saturday, we had a, a life celebration for two of our members, for Sister Jeanette Gordon. We lift that family up to you, God, and we remember them and we remember we remember what it is to lose someone we love, and so we thank God. We pray also for the Hall family, who on Thursday we celebrated the life of their mom. And so it's Sister Maybell Hall, we, we just got to remember that hurt and pain is still there. This morning we received the sad news that our administrative council chairperson, Sister Glenda White, lost her husband, Brother Williams. And we pray for her and we pray for her family, saints. We know that we're not exempt from hurt and pain, but we also know that we have a God who loves us in the midst of our brokenness. Final thing, I love you so much. Thank you for loving on your pastor. Thank you for loving on your church. Most of all, thank you for loving the God who created you in his own image. God bless us and keep us till we see each other's face again. In Jesus' name I pray. Good evening to you. Have a great day. Good, good. I feel good about today. Now let me ask this question. So.